And the great out of doors is a child exploring national parks in South Africa. Oh. So I'm sure there's another story there. Oh. There may be one. <laughs> <laughs> Today she guides a team of communications communicators who tell the stories of the unique and diverse wildlife and wild places of the southern and central California coast. So tonight we will learn about the unique and rare wildlife of the Southern California coast. Let's give a good welcome to Ashley McCombs. Good evening, everyone. Um, I, I am so, ooh, is that loud? I am so excited to be here with you guys tonight. I had the chance to come out and um, visit the museum a couple of weeks ago and I didn't want to leave. It's absolutely stunning, beautiful. I hope I get the chance to explore a little bit more. Um, I certainly won't be offended if your eyes start to gaze out <laughs> that way. Um, it, it's, it's quite a view. Um, I did want to thank Jerry and Martina um, Malero. Hi, Martina, for extending the invitation for me to come out here tonight. Um, just so happy to be here. So a little bit about um, myself. Maybe not. A <laughs> <laughs> little bit about myself. Uh-oh, I think we might have a... Nope. nope. Technical difficulties. There we go. Is it on? Okay. <laughs> All right. So a little bit about myself. Um, I am uh, distantly related to Harry Potter. Um, I, I did. I, I grew up in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. I had a really remarkable childhood exploring South African national parks on my weekends with my family. Um, it was really a, a childhood that I look back very fondly on. Uh, one particular experience that really stands out in my mind, um, I was out on a, on a game drive uh, safari with my, with my mom and my dad. It was starting to get pretty dark, um, started to get pretty cold, the sun had gone down and we were in an open air vehicle. And um, the, the tracker, uh, who was driving our, our vehicle received a radio call uh, from one of his, his colleagues, another tracker. And um, all I heard over the intercom was the word ingwe. Not being a, a, a Koza or a Zulu speaker, I didn't know what that word meant, but we would come to find out very soon. Uh, we set out on our drive and um, a few miles down the road, we stopped underneath a tree. I think it may have been an acacia tree, I believe. Um, it, was, it was darkness. It was pretty dark. It took a while for our eyes to adjust. We couldn't see anything, but it was what we heard that stuck with us. Uh, we looked up, and as our eyes started to adjust, we saw the dangling legs of an antelope of some kind, I think it was an impala, um, dangling from the tree. Uh, we discovered this was a new subspecies of tree climbing impala. No, we did not. Um, this was actually, um, unfortunately, this impala had met its fate, um, and that fate was to be Ingwe's dinner. So um, this was an African leopard. Um, it's a moment that even as I talk about right now, I'm getting a little bit of, of goosebumps that stuck with me uh, in my life. And I, and I feel like it, it's, it's one of those moments that I look back on and I didn't know it at the time. I was probably eight years old. Um, but it's, it's the reason I, I do what I do now. And it's, it's the reason I am where I am. So... Um, many fond memories um, of my time in South Africa. I moved back to the United States in 1998 and um, had, uh, you know, I, I wasn't very good at math 
wasn't very good in biology, but I was a good writer. I was an okay writer, anyway. And I um, decided to go to school in journalism. I ended up um, uh, interning at our local U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service field station because they needed someone to help translate the science of their biologists to the local community. Um, and that was something that I could do. I wasn't, like I said, um, into math or, or into science particularly, but I could write. So I started writing stories for them, writing stories just for their website and, um, and coordinating to get biologists out into, the, out into classrooms to talk about the endangered species that live in these kids' backyards. So that was my start um, into the agency. I moved north uh, to Minnesota for a full-time position um, in public affairs, um, working for the wildlife and sport, sorry, working for the fisheries and migratory birds program for our agency. Um, I got cold in Minnesota. <laughs> I got very cold. Um, I was there for, for five years and I decided I needed to make my way somewhere warmer. Um, that was five years ago, um, and I made my way to Ventura. I haven't looked back since. Um, I now work for the Ventura Fish and Wildlife Office. Um, as I may have mentioned, we have a small field station just a few, a few miles down the road in Ventura. So, I told you a little bit about myself. Now I'd like to share about our agency. So really our mission is the conservation and protection of plants and animals. And in particular, those plants and animals that are facing extinction. Um, along the central California coast, we have more than 100 different species that are considered either threatened or endangered. Um, that's a lot, that's a lot. I can tell you I worked in an office um, in in Missouri, um, the entire state had only 12 endangered species. Here in just the few counties of California, we have um, just between San Mateo and Santa and Los Angeles County, we have more than 100. Lots of different pressures. One of the ways that we protect these species is through the Endangered Species Act. Um, it's a critical safety net for our imperiled wildlife. And tonight, I'm going to talk to you about a few species that are pr currently protected by the Act and one that has actually come back from the brink of extinction to recovery. Uh, any uh, Jenga players out there? <laughs> yeah, all right. So um, I, love, I love to bring this slide up um, when answering a common question that I get. Why? Why care? Why care about this tiny little bird that's hanging out on our shoreline? Why care about, um, you know, animals that maybe we don't see? Why care about little fairy shrimp? Um, some of the species, why care about a little Dudley, a plant that exists nowhere else on earth but the Santa Monica Mountains? Why care? And I like to think about it in this way. When you think about where we are, where we live, we as humans, and everything that we coexist with, the plants and the animals, we're all part of a foundation, right? We're part of a bigger ecosystem. We're part of an environment. We're bricks of a building. We're pieces of a puzzle. If you remove one of those bricks, or say you take out um, one of those Jenga pieces, maybe the building will still stand. You take out two, maybe it might get a little wobbly. You take out three, that whole ecosystem, that whole building could potentially crumble. And so I like that analogy. I think it's a good way of thinking about um, the animals that we live with, that we work, that we, that we as an agency work to protect. Um, we may not know their intrinsic value until it's gone. So we're going to start small. Sorry, preview. Um, we're going to start small and then we're going to go big. 
So tonight I'm going to talk to you about four listed species. It was tough to pick four out of the 100, but we would be here all night if I went through all 100. But um, we're going to start, some, start uh, small and go big. Um, and what I'm hoping to share is a few fun factoids about some of these animals and what you as individuals can do to help out and contribute to their recovery. So this little guy is, uh, any, anyone like to take long, leisurely walks on the beach at night? Yeah, so someone said it right there. So Western snowy plover, excellent. So Western snowy plovers are one of California's smallest shorebirds. Um, they're six, or, I'm sorry, six inches and two ounces, about the size of a, or about the weight of a tennis ball. Light, light little things. Um, and you might see them scurrying along the rack line as you're taking your evening walk on the beach. You might confuse them for sanderlings. Sanderlings are the more common species. Those are the ones that are kind of in groups, kind of going in and out of the waves. Um, Western snowy plovers um, don't do that quite as much. But they're actually after those little pesky sand flies that you guys may not enjoy um, if, if they're out there perhaps uh, you know, getting on your ankles or, or whatnot. So that's, that's a snowy plover's favorite meal. These guys were listed as threatened uh, in 1993. And that's primarily due to their habitat loss. A lot of the areas they use are the same areas that we use um, as beachgoers and, and recreationists. So you can only imagine if, if mom and dad are two ounces, how small kiddos must be. So western snowy plover chicks are about the size of a cotton ball. Um, and they look like a cotton ball as well. Um, ladies, you might be particularly interested in knowing that it's actually uh, dad that takes care of the chicks uh, when mom goes off to find a new mate and lay a new nest. Yes. Well done, Dad. So what's, what's really particularly interesting about these birds, and, and a really critical time for them, is their breeding season. Um, March through September. We're in the heart of it right now. Now, you might, while well, these eggs look quite big on screen, um, they're barely visible to the naked eye. Um, we have biologists in our office that are able to to pick one out, and I don't know how they do it. I, they have x-ray vision or something like that. Um, but they are barely visible to the naked eye. And, and what I mentioned was um, these guys are using that same prime real estate that we use for picnics on the beach. And um, uh, so there is kind of a competing uh, resource there. So they're very vulnerable to trampling by beachgoers. So I'd like to show you a, a quick video. Um, amazing footage of these little guys, actually never taken before footage, um, from a documentary filmmaker that we worked with um, in, uh, in Santa Barbara County. And this is going to talk a little bit about how you guys can help out with the plovers during the breeding season. Not entirely. <laughs> The western snowy plover, a shy bird the color of sand. We guess there were hundreds here then, nesting on the open sand amongst the other more obvious species. Western snowy plovers are easy to overlook and not the showiest shorebirds. As more and more people have come to California, things have begun to change for the snowy plover. People came to the beach to have fun. They didn't notice the plovers as they trampled the dunes, built their fires, and drove their vehicles. Their dogs noticed the plovers and chased them from one end of the beach to the other. 
How do you protect snowy plover habitat and yet keep the beach open to the public? One solution is symbolic fencing. These fences have been erected at Orland Beach, Sands Beach, and other threatened breeding sites, dividing the beach between the shoreline and the breeding areas, along with signs educating the public about the birds. Some breeding sites have enhanced this with on-site volunteers or docents who can explain and enforce the division of the beach and make sure dogs are on a leash. Once they understand the reasons, most beach users are happy to comply. It is also critical to protect snowy plovers from predators such as overpopulated raccoons, crows, and skunks. And it is essential to restore the fragile dune ecosystem. It doesn't take much for us to share the beach and help bring these birds back to a healthy, sustainable population. The good news is that these measures are working. After having abandoned breeding sites such as Sands Beach, the breeding population of plovers has returned to it and have now had 15 successful years of breeding there. Other sites have had success stories as well. Humans can reverse the damage done to a threatened species by just learning to share their habitat. And they also get to see this special bird in the wild, back in its natural habitat where it resided for thousands of years in the past. While there has been remarkable progress up and down the Pacific coast, there is still a long way to go in the recovery of the snowy plover. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has created a recovery plan which provides an invaluable guide for land managers as they work together to help recover this tiny shorebird. Here are some easy things you can do when in a snowy plover habitat. When walking up and down on the beach, stay on the wet, hard-packed sand. Plovers use this area less than the upper beach. Pick up remains of food and trash. Remains of food attract crows and small mammals that prey on plover eggs. Choose a beach that's not used by snowy plovers to exercise your dog. Or, if you do bring your dog, make sure to keep it on a leash and away from fenced areas at all times. If plovers react to you, retreat several paces and walk in a wide arc around them. Finally, you can help teach the community about snowy plovers and the sandy beach ecosystems. Working together, we can find a balance between recreation and conservation to ensure this special little bird thrives as it did in the past. Um, particularly interesting about these birds, um, they have defense mechanisms. If they're approached by, an an by a predator or, an or a human, they'll actually um, pretend to be um, they'll, they'll pretend to be injured to, and, and move away from the nest to detract um, the predator from the nest. So they'll actually put their, put their wings out and, and basically say, hey, I'm over here. To, dis to distract that predator from the nest. It's something I think killdeers do as well. Maybe some other species of really unique behavior. Um, this is, uh, I love this headline, Rare Birds Find SoCal Beach Housing. Um, <laughs> this was a headline in the Los Angeles Times, I think it was two years ago. Um, and it, what is particularly remarkable, this little plover right here uh, was discovered nesting on a beach in Los Angeles County for the first time in 70 years. There had been restoration efforts ongoing at some of those beaches. Um, and to us, what that says is that we can coexist with these animals. Um, it's a really remarkable success story. Um, that's the place I want to live, right? I want to live somewhere where, you know, we can enjoy the beaches, uh, walk our dogs, and also share that space with animals like this. So I said we're going to start small and we're going to go big, and we're going to go very big. So, I have a feeling this bird does not need an introduction. Does someone want to tell me who this guy is? This is a California condor. The photo on the left is at uh, Hopper Mountain National Wildlife Refuge. It's 
um, an area of land just above the town of Fillmore. And it was, it was uh, established as a wildlife refuge specifically for California condors and to help in their recovery. Now what folks may or may not know is that just in the 1980s, um, there were only 22 of these birds left in the wild. 22. 22. Um, and the reason for that um, is twofold. Uh, micro trash is an issue with condors. Bottle caps, pieces of little shiny objects that folks discard um, that end up everywhere in our environment. Um, the condors will actually ingest that um, and as you can imagine will, would do a number on their digestive system and can actually ultimately cause them to starve, uh, starve and die. Um, they'll also feed those little pieces to their chicks um, and that will cause starvation for the chick. The second primary, the, well the actual, the primary cause of uh, California a condor mortality is lead poisoning. Um, and that's something I'm going to get into in just a moment. But first, any Fiat or VW drivers in the room? Really? No? Okay. Prius? Yeah. All right. Okay. So the wingspan of this bird is about the size of your car. Uh, these guys can live up to 60 years. They're scavengers, they eat dead animals. So getting back to the fact that lead poisoning kills these animals, um, the primary cause of that is because condors eat, uh, eat carrion or dead animals, how might those animals have died? They were shot. So in most cases, um, that is the, well, in all cases, that is the source of lead poisoning. Um, so lead, lead bullets will fragment um, across the body of, um, of the animal, whether that's a deer or a cow, um, the condor will eat that animal and ingest that lead. Um, in a lot of cases, we bring those animals in and we actually um, do chelation treatment on them. It's, it's kind of like similar to chemo um, to uh, reduce that lead content in the animals and then release them. But 50% um, of, of all condors that, um, that have died have died due to lead poisoning. This is just remarkable. Um, because these animals are scavengers, they have to go far and wide to find their food. They can travel up to 150 miles, um, up to 150 miles in a single day, up to 55 miles per hour um, at altitudes of 15,000 feet which I did the calculation is 2.8 miles up. It's pretty high up there. So the California Condor Recovery Program, as I mentioned, in 1982, there were only 22 of these birds left in the wilds. At that point, when those numbers were so low, we actually brought the species into captivity to start a captive, captive breeding program and kept those animals in captivity for several years. The last bird was brought into captivity in 1987, and then the first birds were released back into the wild in 1992. We hit a milestone in, 19, in 2008, um, after those condors had started to be released again. We were at the point where we had more condors in the wild than in captivity. That was a turning point for the program. And most recently today, we can say that we have uh, more than 470 California condors in existence um, wow. in comparison to 1997 when there were only 22. Wow. A remarkable recovery program. More than half of that number is in the wild population. All right, we're going to play one more video here. Um, and this is a video that's going to cover our um, condor recovery and how kids are involved.
Have you ever wondered what it would be like to soar high above California? Imagine looking down and seeing deep canyons pass by. Mountains gilded in the warm light of sunset. A sparkling silver ocean that slowly comes into view. Or a town filled with life and laughter just below. This is one of the rarest views in the world as seen through the eyes of one of the rarest creatures. The California condor. And there is great hope for its future on the horizon. Here we're surrounded by natural habitats. More California condors live in Ventura County than anywhere else and most of these students didn't even know they had condors or what a condor was. We have read about the condors, we've researched, but until we see it, it's not going any deeper than that. So that's what I'm excited and I look forward to, is to just see that excitement on their face, seeing something for the very first time. We bring the stories of these animals in their habitats to our visitors. That way, they can learn how they too can become advocates for these species. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. It's very hands-on, very interactive. It's exciting. We're not spending all our time just reading a book or just writing a paragraph. We're actually interacting and within nature and all these different things. What this, this monstrosity is. The Condor Kids Program and Connecting People with Nature is extending way beyond the classroom. They're way ahead of the general public on knowledge of condors, and more importantly, conservation in general. Wildlife Service in the Santa Barbara Zoo. There are two We're conservation partners. The role of zoos has changed. We're also doing work in the field. We feel responsible for these animals. If the condors can't successfully fledge a chick, they don't have a fighting chance. So some of the techniques that are used in the zoos were developed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, rescuing condors from the wild. Whether it's zoo camp, condor kids, the education side is critical. Then stand right here. Creating a passion is easy in kids. Yeah, look like maybe coyote. They, are, they want to be passionate, they want to enjoy school, they want to enjoy life, and I think the teacher needs to have the passion too. You need someone who's going to take that passion and you want to make sure that they are passionate about things that are positive and help our environment. When I have the opportunity to work with children who live right there with the condors and see their enthusiasm, it just, my heart swells. Doesn't necessarily have to be a 
National Wildlife Refuge. All of our metropolitan areas, our neighborhood parks, our open spaces, our river trails that can serve as a place for urban residents to experience nature. Okay. So, um, <coughs> California condors, uh, one thing that's particularly interesting, I have a feather here. Um, this, is, this is from a California condor. Oh, actually, I'll pass it around if you guys want to take a peek. Um, we actually have an egg as well here. This is a... I, you know, if we had it, it would, it would, I would have lost it. <laughs> um, so California condors are actually outfitted with um, these uh, transmitters, and this is what helps us track the population. Um, so if you ever see, if you're driving in the Big Sur area, maybe Pinnacles, have your binoculars out. Um, if you see a bird has something similar to this, you're, you're, you might be looking at a California condor. So I'll go ahead and pass these around. There you go. Now, um, I can't get enough condors. Uh, I thought you guys might um, not be able to get enough condors. Um, there's something really remarkable. Um, we're actually, we actually have a, a, a live streaming webcam inside uh, one of the California condor nests, and it's gonna be going live in just a couple of weeks. Uh, we started this several years ago. It's something the biologists actually use to, to monitor the chicks, and um, you guys will be able to check that out. I did want to share a clip from one of those uh, particular um, uh, videos from last year. Uh, it's just too cute not to share. Um, so this little guy, I'm not sure how old he is, maybe a month or more, um, and I, I think he's playing with a stick. He finds something. Harry found it. Did they build their nests in the crevices of the rocks? Is that it? So they do. They they um, they don't create their nests. They just find caves and crevices like this. Um, it's quite interesting. Um, so, oh, I think it. I think he finished playing. Um, so, if you're interested, the, these kinds of clips. If you're on Facebook, join the Condor Cave. It is a hoot to watch these um, these birds. Um, we have little clips uh, just like this that um, are just remarkable to watch. Ah, from condors to certain marine mammal. Um, any kayakers out there that like to hang out at Morro Bay, Monterey Bay, Elkhorn Slough maybe? spent any time up that way. Um, so this uh, particular animal is a southern sea otter. Uh, these were listed as threatened in 1997. Um, so we don't have them here in Ventura County, but we have them nearby. Um, there's also southern sea otters in, uh, near San Nicolas Island. And actually last year, uh, there was a southern sea otter, I think a male, that was uh, taking a swim, a little far, um, that did end up in Ventura County. Mm -hmm. So they are expanding their range. Southern, <clears throat> Southern sea otters in the 18th and 19th uh, centuries were um, hunted for their pelts. And they were hunted to, to near extinction. They used to live across the Pacific Rim um, from Japan, across Russia to the Aleutian Islands, um, all the way down North America, Baja California as well. Um, but as I mentioned, hunting wiped them out completely. <coughs> or so we thought. In the early 1900s, there were several remnant colonies that were discovered. And um, some of the, one of those colonies was off the Big Sur coastline. 
she's enjoying that feather, um, off the Big Sur coastline. Um, it's thought that perhaps because that area was so, so rugged, somehow those sea otters were able to be protected and they were not hunted. All sea otters that we, all California sea otters, aka southern sea otters that we have today are remnant of that one colony of a couple dozen otters. Today, we have about 3,000 southern sea otters, and um, the kicker is that they only encompass about 13% of their original range. So range expansion is, is something that's certainly necessary for sea otters. Um, right now, you can find them from San Mateo uh, to Santa Barbara County and San Nicolas Island as well. These guys have a, an instrumental role um, in our marine ecosystems. They're, they're what's called keystone species. And there's a lot of um, ecological relationships that one of our biologists could do a much better job of explaining than I can. But in a nutshell, um, they keep sea urchin and crab populations in check, which helps kelp forests and seagrass beds, which provide habitat and food for a wide range of species, um, allow, those, allow those to thrive. No blubber, all fur. <laughs> Unlike other marine mammals, southern sea otters do not have a blubber layer to keep warm. They're all fur, and it's incredibly dense fur. Um, and they rely, on, they rely on that fur to keep warm um, and burning calories. So what's incredibly critical for southern sea otters is to take naps. They take a lot of naps. Um, and they, they have to get a lot of rest to build that energy, to find food, and to raise their young. So um, in engaging with sea otters, um, when folks are out on kayaks, it's really best to stay, stay as far back as you can. We have some recommendations for that. Um, I'll get to that in a moment. Ah, another threat. Um, so great white sharks uh, in recent years have posed a threat to southern sea otters on the northern and southern parts of their, of their range. Um, they're, they're looking for pinnipeds. They're looking for fat, rich pinnipeds. And they are mistaking otters for fat, rich pinnipeds. So they take a bite of that otter, realize that's not what I thought it was, and spit it back out. Um, unfortunately, that bite is fatal uh, for, the, for the otter. So that's a unique um, and interesting uh, role there. And that has really been one of the barriers to range expansion for southern sea otters. Respect the nap. Um, as I mentioned, a few recommendations. If you guys are up in um, the Morrow Bay or Elkhorn Slough area, um, I would highly recommend it. If you haven't been there, it's absolutely beautiful. The wildlife there is unbelievable. And um, a few recommendations, though, if you're out on the water, you know, stay at least 20 meters back uh, from the otters. Stay parallel, parallel to them. Keep moving on past. Uh, we've had a few instances of of folks getting too close and an otter actually jumping on someone's kayak. You might have seen that on YouTube in the last few years. It's really dangerous. You don't want a 60-pound animal related to the wolverine on your kayak. Um, not safe for you and not safe for the animal. So this is a story that um, I love because it's a story of inspiration. Um, any folks uh, have been to uh, Santa Cruz Island or Santa, okay, everybody, um, Santa Rosa Island, San Miguel, uh, chances are you've seen one of these guys. We're curious, curious little creatures. This is a Channel Islands box. And, you know, they really are icons of the Channel Islands ecosystem. I remember when I first moved here five years ago and I saw my first island fox and I just, it's like, there's fox on island? This is amazing. Um, these guys were listed as endangered 
in the very recent history, in 2004. Um, and they recovered after listing faster than any other land mammal in the history of the ESA. And we're going to talk about why that is. So extinction for these animals was, was imminent. Uh, catastrophic declines in the 1990s. You can see the numbers there from 1994 on Santa Cruz Island, 1,400. Um, just five years later, only 55. Um, very similar situations on San Miguel and Santa Rosa with even fewer animals living. So the question remains, what happened? Why, why this drastic sharp decline in such a very short period of time? So let's talk about it. Simple. All right. Museum presents Guo Pei, That's Couture not Beyond, internationally acclaimed fashion designer. Not quite. There may be a commercial. You know, it might just. Okay. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service does not endorse this. Tickets now available at Bowers.org. Yeah, right. It's a 90-minute boat ride from Ventura Harbor to Santa Cruz Island, part of the Channel Islands National Park. I heard it's a place of minor miracles, where plants and animals on the verge of extinction are now thriving. Our first mission, to spot a cat-sized creature called the Island Fox. We see them all around, I'm so surprised. And I'm told, I'm gonna see how close I can get to them. I'm told that they've gotten really used to people. Not quite that used to people. We're outfoxed by this island fox, but the biologists of the National Park Service and the National Fish and Wildlife Service are craftier. How many traps do we have set out here? Right now we have 31 that have been set up for several days. We have three trap nights and three trap days. We check them in the morning and the evening. That's a lot of traps. Yeah. So how many of those 31 traps do I have foxes in? We have about 20 captures we had yesterday. Wow. Quite a few. That's a lot. When we pull them out, we, we listen to their lungs, we listen to their heart rate, we check their eyes, their mouth, we give them a good once-over, basically to see what sort of condition they're in. Julie and Laura are thrilled that they have so many foxes to check up on. Not long ago, there were only about a hundred of them. These animals, found only on the Channel Islands, were headed for extinction. In 2004, it got so bad, they were put on the endangered species list. We scan for a pit tag, which is a microchip in the animal. And if it is a new animal, we will give it a health exam. It gets a new pit tag. We give them a body score to determine um, what sort of what state of health they're actually in. Have they been eating enough food? Um, is there signs of starvation going on? And through that examination, we can get a lot of information. It gets a rabies vaccination as a precaution in case rabies were ever introduced to the island. Um, and then we also take blood for genetic and other um, research that's being done, uh, genetic studies, looking for pathogens, things like that. The good news is the ones we've checked in this area this morning have all been in very good condition, very happy with them. So how did these little guys almost disappear? It was a case of an environmental domino effect, starting with the toxic insecticide DDT. For decades, DDT was dumped in the ocean off the Southern California coast. It poisoned fish. 
fish that were then eaten by bald eagles. Then the bald eagles started dying out. That was the cue for golden eagles to sweep in from the mainland. These eagles prefer feral pigs and foxes to fish. Between 1994 and 2000, the golden eagles preyed on the island fox. Their numbers dropped by 95%. They were declared endangered. One of the things that's incredible about the Endangered Species Act is it's the ultimate mobilizer. It brings people together. When you put something on the list, it's like a, a red flag. We need to really do something. The first thing they did was hunt down and remove the wild non-native pigs. Then they trapped the golden eagles and returned them to the mainland. And those few surviving island foxes, the lucky ones, or maybe just the fastest, were gathered into a captive breeding program. It worked. Today, there are more than 7,000 foxes roaming the Channel Islands. In 2016, these little guys were taken off the endangered list. It was the fastest recovery of any mammal species in the history of the Endangered Species Act. But wildlife officials still keep close tabs on them. What's really important when you take something off the list is what we call post-delisting monitoring. So in the case of the island fox, we have management agreements with our partners, such as the Nature Conservancy and the Park Service, to make sure that monitoring will happen at least 10 years after we took it off the endangered species list. That way we know for sure that really it's going to be okay. We have really good numbers of foxes, and with any population, the more individuals you have, the more resiliency there is to various stressors that can happen to the population. Channel Islands National Park is known as the Galapagos of North America. The five islands are home to more than 2,000 species of plants and animals. 145 of them found nowhere else on the planet. The park was established in 1980. Its ocean surroundings make it one of the least visited of all the national parks. That may be one reason why the fox has recovered so quickly. Other animals, like the brown pelican, also benefited from having so few humans around. We're lucky enough to be a few of those humans. We got rare access to a place just a stone's throw away from the harbor. Thank you, Clyde. Oh, yeah. We're heading out to a place called Scorpion Rock. Scorpion Rock is a unique little offshore rock. It's really important for nesting seabirds. The Channel Islands provide the most important seabird nesting habitat for seabirds in Southern California. And this rock in particular is important because it doesn't have any native mammal mammalian predators. There's no island foxes on this rock. There's no island mice. Uh, so it provides a really nice, secure nesting habitat for seabirds. But that nesting habitat was destroyed, not by a pesticide or a predator. This time, the villain was an alien vegetation called crystalline ice plant. This is what the rock looked like about 10 years ago. It basically covered the entire rock and prevented seabirds from burrowing down into the soil and making their nests. So our goal out here was to try and remove the ice plant first and then to restore the habitat by putting back in native plants that are found here on Santa Cruz Island. Little by little, Ann and her team replanted scorpion rock. It was a labor-intensive task. We call this extreme restoration on this rock because you have to bring all your plants to the rock, bring it up the steep cliff, and then plant them. So we've learned a lot about what works, how much you need to water, how big the plants need to be when you put them in the ground. And we're able to apply those techniques not only to the other Channel Islands, but also to the mainland as well, as we learn more and how to improve the techniques and increase our success. Over time, Scorpion Rock went from this to this in springtime. With the ice plant gone, the nesting birds have returned. It's okay if you hold it? Yes. <clears throat> oh my gosh. <laughs> so this is a Cassin's Offwood chick. And they'll be in the, the chamber for about 30 days, and then they will go back out to sea. <laughs> but success hasn't guaranteed support. The Trump administration has threatened to withdraw protected status for the waters around the Channel Islands. And if offshore drilling is allowed back in the area, 
So we'll move on. <laughs> so um, the island fox, uh, going back to the island fox recovery, um, one of the fa the fastest recovery of any land mammal under the Endangered Species Act, and it, it really was a um, a community wide effort. I think there were more than 300 organizations that were involved in island fox recovery, and it took took people saying, "We're not going to let this happen on our watch. We're not going to let this species go." Um, the Nature Conservancy and the National Park Service land managers on some of those islands um, really did what needed to be done um, in terms of the captive propagation program. And um, as a result, the islands today are, are not what they were years ago. Um, they're coming back, and they're coming back beautifully. Um, and they're places that we all love and we all enjoy. Um, truly a, a success story in my book. Um, you can see a few numbers here from 2014. Um, numbers have just really come back, um, and we were able to, to remove that species from the endangered species list just a couple of years ago. So um, this, is a, this is a photo of, uh, I think it's of Santa Rosa Island taken from Santa Cruz Island. At morning, um, as the sun was rising, this was taken from a colleague of mine that was out there doing some plant surveys just a couple of weeks ago. Um, and to me, it, it really kind of summarizes um, why we, all, why I care about all of this, and why I think um, the communities that we live in um, uh, care too. I mean, we live in one of the most beautiful, remarkable areas. Um, in the world, in my opinion, and uh, they're worth protecting, they're worth conserving. Uh, the species that we live alongside for, for future generations. Um, we're so lucky, I pinch myself uh, often uh, thinking about um, the work I get to do and the people I get to work with um, and being able to see vistas like that. Um, maybe someday uh, a little girl will see a California condor and say, and that is her, her ingue moment, um, perhaps. That's, that's kind of what we're here to do. Um, that's what the Fish and Wildlife Service is about. Um, I will say, if folks are, are interested in learning more about our agency, there's a lot more um, that we do. Uh, we have a website, we have a newsletter. Um, you can sign up, we send out quarterly updates. We're on the social uh, networks. If you'd like to find out more about us there and follow us. Um, but thank you all so much for your time. If you have specific questions about some of the animals that we talked about or other questions, um, I can kind of hang out in the back over there. Um, we have lots of little fact sheets about specific cool fun factoids about species, um, about some of these species that I discussed some take-home books. We have some coloring books. If you guys have any kids or grandkids that you'd like to take some home, please, uh, please, please feel free. Um, there's some materials in there in the back, but thank you so much for your time. Thank you for being here tonight. Come back and see us next month okay. because the speaker well, the, well, for the speaker series, we'll also have a display that covers the entire part of this end of the room. Okay. Wow. You want to answer questions here? Looks like you have one sure. right here. Sure. I'm just curious about the otter. Okay. How it's reestablished at San Nicolas Island. Is there an explanation of how it's reestablished only at that island and not? Yeah, so that's a very interesting, there's a complex history involved with that, and there was actually translocation efforts to expand the population. Um, so some actually sea otters were moved to San Nicolas Island. This was quite some time ago, um, but there are some remnant sea otters there. Yes. It's lovely to imagine these creatures out there, but... 
why would it matter if they were allowed to be non-extinct? Why would it matter? Yes. I mean, tell us that we're going to starve or we can no longer get wine or food. <laughs> 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 um, the Jenga question. Yeah, you know, some of these guys, we, you know, we don't know they're, in, like you said, they're in intrinsic value, um, but a lot of these species play key roles in, in their ecosystems. For example, Island Fox is the apex predator um, on the Channel Islands, so they are, um, you know, responsible for keeping some of those other small um, uh, mammal populations in check. Um, otherwise, um, their populations could, could expand. Sea otters certainly um, play a, a very similar role in their ecosystems, um, where if you tar start to take some of those animals out, then um, we don't know what those potential impacts could be, and I don't think we want to find out that answer. Yeah. You should. You should have something really cataclysmic. <laughs> <laughs> when I come up with that, I'll, I will. I will let you know. <laughs> Comment about the snowy clovers. We have places roped up on Hollywood Beach, but and Ormond Beach. Uh, Tom and I were docent for the snowy clovers about a year ago. Oh, thank you. So Last much. year we had 17 babies hatched. Only one survived, and that was one that was removed from the beach. Um, a lot of problems with the crows, but we also have between. They're hard to see, and of course, they don't all respect the roped off areas. So if anyone comes across um, a nest or eggs that are not in the roped off area, if they will contact Ventura Audubon, they'll get somebody out there to uh, put some protective cage around it. But one of the biggest problems is the crows. Thank you so much for the work that you guys do because it's it's really very helpful um, educating folks. Um, it's huge. You guys are out there um, every day, and it's like we saw it up in Sands Beach at, at UCSB at the Coal Oil Point Reserve. It can work. It can work if people respect the signage. Yeah. One of the first pictures you had up there was of the bird, and it had four bees on the on the legs, and they four different colors. Yes. What, what are those bees? So those are bands um, that are put on. Um, in some cases, uh, as we mentioned, um, snowy plover parents will can abandon the nests um, of if they're disturbed by a predator. And we actually work with Coal Oil Point Reserve and the Santa Barbara Zoo to take those birds, those, those um, either unhatched chicks or hatched chicks, into rehabilitation. Um, little bands are put on them for identification purposes, and then they're released back into the wild. So why, it's why, a trap. Why four? Why four? There were four bands, and they had, each one had a different color. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I'll, I can check with our clover biologists. Yeah. There we go. Where it was found, mm -hmm. and uh, you can tell how far it's traveled, and if they can sex it, uh, you know, to get to all those, and there's a code, and you have to look it up to see where they're from. So different identifiers, yeah. each yeah. one marks a different identifier. Thank you. Thank you. I heard a voice. Hi. If, if you have so many boxes, you know, so Kat had mentioned, one of our biologists in the film, that um, we monitor, we're essentially monitoring the population as they're delisted to see how they're doing. Um, that hasn't been an issue, there hasn't been an overpopulation issue um, in the past. Um, Kat would be the best person to ask about some of that more detailed monitoring and, and how they're looking at it. Um, but it hasn't, has not been um, an issue up to this point, overpopulation. But should it happen? Is there a plan in place of what to do with these that don't live any place else? 
I think that uh, the concern is is for their numbers to potentially go down again. So that's part of that post delisting monitoring plan is to make sure. And I tell you what, the Park Service and the Nature Conservancy are are such good stewards of those islands um, that they're keeping close tabs on the situation and they're very interested in seeing that ecosystem maintain balance. Yeah. Are, they, are they transferring any of the population to the other islands? Um, transferring any of which? Um, of the foxes and the bugs. Um, Not that I'm aware of. Oh, there's no plan to? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. That, that would be a good question for the Park Service. Yeah. Um, we were out at one of the islands a few months back, in Santa Cruz, and sitting at picnic tables, and they were literally crawling around my feet. So oh, it seemed there. that they, they didn't have any fear of humans. But that's one thing. My question mm -hmm. is, how did the wildlife workers keep those foxes from squirming out of their hands? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, you. <laughs> They've done it before. <laughs> you know, this was not sedated or anything like that. Did they have something over them, over their mouths? Or yeah, because they seem they seem frozen. Yeah. So the that would be a um, good question for the veterinarian that that maintains and holds the foxes. Um, you know, this was something that hadn't ever been done before propagation of, of this particular species. So a lot of it was was trial and error and figuring out what was going to work. Um, that's why there were multiple veterinarians, zoos, organizations, universities, 300 plus that were working on the island fox recovery. Um, so there were a lot of lot, lot of lessons learned and figuring out what was going to work. Yes, sir. I've spoken with a veterinarian uh, that was involved. And these uh, foxes often are handled without any gloves. They're just very docile for some reason. They just scrub them and pull them out. And wow. you can do just about anything you want to. If they're a little bit squirmy, they put like a little uh, mask over their head. That's it. Wow. But they just, you saw how stiff they were. They just kind of stiffen out and that's it. And they, don't, they don't seem to mind. Kind of like picking up your, your, cat. your house cat. They are the, and they are the size of the house cat. Yeah. Oh, no, they just, until the wolf eagles came in and they were, their population plummeted, they had no predators, so they don't have that instinct to be afraid of predators. They didn't have predators. They were sitting ducks. Yeah. <laughs> For lack of a better word. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.